Let's do it. Let's get it. Dude. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome back to the Pointless Pantless Podcast. I am your co-host, Tanner Allman, and Luca Davey, your other co-host. Forgot to take off my pants. Oh, Luca, that's literally the name of the podcast. I know, I always forget and then I do it on camera. You know what, it's okay. Where the pants are off, the conversations are silly. And the topics are sometimes meaningful. Welcome, one and all. Yeah. Dude, I am very happy with how my beard is coming in right now. Like this, this it's a little grainy, so it's hard for me to tell. You know what? That's fair. It's a not good computer picture, but you know what? That's okay. It feels spiritually like a good beard. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. do appreciate that. You're welcome. Ugh. Well, so look at you said you've been drawing a bit. What have you been drawing? Yeah, I'll show you. Hold on. Hold on. Hold your uh, your horses. Keep them tight. My horses are being held. Good man. I'll figure out this share screen thing again. Do desktop. There we go. You see that? You That's it? a big boy. Okay, I'll start with Start with this one. Okay, looks like a so, map. This is the fall of man. Okay. The, the dragon is Satan, and the ape creature is man. Oh, I see it now, okay. Yeah, so I was kind of playing with the idea that Satan is kind of similar to the uh the myth of prometheus oh okay yes so prometheus was a titan um yes. zeus didn't want man to like continue to become more powerful uh prometheus decided that he was going to steal fire and give it to man yes 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 i remember that story yeah so that elevated man which, but it's very similar to what Satan did, where he kind of gave man something, except in this case, it was obviously no bueno, mm -hmm. a bad thing. But at the same time, I was thinking, like, the idea was if they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the temptation was they would become like God. Yes. So was, there's still this idea of, like, ascension, in the fall of man, we did gain something, but it wasn't necessarily a good thing. So this is kind of the ape kind of ascending as he, you can see in his palm there. Yes. As he's gaining the fire. Yes. So yeah. Huh. You can see the dragon's also holding the, uh, the apple yeah, right okay. there. And this is a... Uh, Kind of a false word. It's like the Bible, but it's got this nasty gross tongue coming out of it. That's how I was wondering what that was. So that's like the deception. And then there's a little brain just to represent um, man. Man's intelligence, which it makes I, it more than just an animal. I dig that. That's really sick. I'm pretty like proud that. of it. I think it might. You know, I'm not sure if it's blasphemous to make Satan look this cool. You know what? That's good. He looks. He does look really sick. That was my favorite part of the drawing. He looks really cool. I I wanted to go with the like serpent imagery, so I mm -hmm. tried to make him like a rip, reptile. And there's not really image any like s symbolic meaning behind it, but the actual head has no eyes. All of them are on the wings, and they are actually looking at the uh, at the person. Now, I had this idea after I drew it. I wanted, I should have given the the pupils instead of like slits, like reptile eyes. Mm -hmm. I should have done it uh, like the rectangular pupil, like goats. So I, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah I so see. I get a little bit of the imagery of also the goat. Yeah, I see that. That makes sense. But anyways, pretty happy with it. I'm not sure exactly why I decided to make man this weird creature, but I just wanted to make it look a little bit monstrous as we gain 
the knowledge of evil? It it seems kind of fitting for the story and for the picture that you're going for. Yeah. So it's like it's an ape, but it's like rising and becoming something more. Yeah. Even though the man already was more than an ape. True. I don't know. I'm more going for like a feeling than yeah, I, I can symbol, that. symbolism. It's definitely it's definitely off putting and takes some readjusting. Yeah. But like that feeling, like I, I, I feel like I understand it and I feel like I get it. Yeah. And like the hands have different numbers of fingers if you look closely. Yeah, they do. To make them look a little weird. And also halos on them to make them look kind of holy at the same time because we are still in God's image. Hmm. I like it. That's fire. Yeah, this is one of my favorite drawings. I think this might be actually my best work so far. And I'm also proud of the name because I'm usually terrible at naming things, but I called it Falling Angel Rising Ape. Ooh, that that's going in my that's going in my album title. It's going See, in my I technically album title stole it from an author, but he was going for a different idea with it. He uh, he was going for the idea that people create meaning to live life. Make okay. Like meant meaning to live life, so the so that's us becoming more of an ape and kind of reaching at something a little bit more abstract and powerful. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So I the see. falling angel is like the abstract ideas, and the rising ape is like man creating meaning, which is you know a kind of a cool idea. Don't entirely agree with that philosophy, but I decided to use what he called it. <laughs> that's fair. I can respect that. And then the other one here was another attempt to show the fall of man but i didn't like it as much so i didn't really go go as far with this one it's kind of just another monstrous image of a man i was about to say i remember you posting this one and i saw that and i was like that is a brutal demon that i would come across in the game of doom yeah it's like a monstrous version of a man i tried to kind of give it some aspects of the of the rendition of satan I see it. Kind of melding with a humanoid figure. And I actually did the goat eye on this one. Oh, okay. I see. Left I see. side on the eye. That's yeah. fire. And then I decided to not really finish the apple up there. So it's just kind of, just kind <laughs> of there. Kind of there. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I've been drawing. Dang, those are fire, dude. I like those. This is actually mostly inspired by have you seen the anime neon genesis evangelion have not seen it but my friends really love it and they talk oh, about dude. it a lot i just finished watching it not that long ago uh-huh. great show so i decided yeah. to go this monster looks similar to the mechas that they have in that anime Similar themes because the mechas are partly cloned gods. That's what? Yeah, let me. Sh- should that's we talk fire. about Neon Genesis Evangelion? Because that show is freaking great. Dude, that's fire. All right, I'm in. Let's do it. Okay, I'll give you a quick, a quick rundown of the lore. So, the lore of the show, first of all, is really not even what the show's about, it's kind of a side thing. Honestly, it's kind of just a vehicle for the author's, like, introspection of of the human condition. It sounds super, like, uh, what's the word? Not ambitious. What's the bad version of ambitious? Oh, um, pro, pro, pro. We're thinking the same word. (laughs) Not presumptuous. Pretentious. Pretentious. That's what the word is. It sounds super pretentious. Yeah. Um, but he did a great job with it, honestly. It was super cool. But but yeah, okay. So the lore basically is that mm. there was a, a race of aliens in the distant past. I think they're just called the old right. ones. Just a yeah. generic name for it. Anyway. Um, and these aliens seeded life on other planets 
Okay. Talking about Neon Genesis Evangelion. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm trying to explain the lore. <laughs> and That's the, a kicker. <laughs> so, so they seeded life on other planets with these eggs, which are really the size of like a moon. So they're not really eggs, but they, but they are. And they sent these to, to a bunch of different planets. There's two different kinds. There was a kind that, the, that they call Adam and a kind that they call Lilith. There's a lot of Christian and Jewish symbolism in these shows. But in this one show. called Adam and one called what? Lilith. Lilith. Okay. Which in Adam, obviously, we understand that as the first man. Yeah. So that symbolism is pretty obvious. But Lilith is a Jewish myth. She is supposed to be um, Adam's first wife before Eve, hmm. but it's a myth. It's not biblical. And she is kind of a rebel. She's kind of associated with like evil and demons and stuff. Okay. So these two seeds are different. The Adam seed creates these creatures that they call angels. Okay. These creatures are, they're powerful. They're godlike creatures that determine their form based on like their inner mind state and they're like made of energy at one point they say in the show but they have like physical bodies but it's kind of a manifestation of their energy okay wild yeah so they're like these really big kaiju type creatures kaiju are always sick can never go wrong with kaiju yeah have you seen pacific rim no but it's right up my alley yeah pacific rim is loosely based on this anime the the um premise is based on this anime okay cool okay then lilith she released she she basically like bleeds this fluid called they call it in the show lcl and it's the idea of like the primordial soup that uh like life was supposedly evolved from so she seeds worlds with this fluid that allows organisms to evolve from Okay, okay. We came from Lilith in the show, and all other life came from her blood fluid. But here's the bad thing Adam and Lilith seeds can't coexist. Okay. They don't like each other. And when the, the DNA of Adam and Lilith come in contact, it's supposed to be like apocalyptic. There's, like, a huge energy release that, like, destroys stuff. Okay. No bueno. Okay. So the angels and Lilith seed, so Adam and Lilith seed, seed both accidentally ended up on Earth. Now, okay. Adam's seed was dormant in Antarctica. Humans, I think it was in the show, like, in 2005, because this show was made in, like, 95. Mm -hmm. so sometime i think in 2000 or 2005 something like that somewhere in the 2000 early 2000s man found adam and accidentally mixed the dna because we're have lilith's dna Mm -hmm. and something called the second impact happened they don't really ever explain why it's called the second one like what is the first one but it's the second one (laughs) oh uh, it destroys half of life on earth oh huge explosion but it releases the angels okay so now these kaiju creatures are trying to destroy lilith's seed they're searching the earth and okay man has to defend lilith lilith's seed to uh basically save humanity and there's a secret organization called nerve not nerve they pronounce it nerve which is super annoying every time they say it in the show Nerve. They're defending Lilith's seed, and it's a secret. Now, the rest of the world doesn't know that it's Lilith. They think that the kaiju are just kind of coming and attacking humanity for no reason. Mm-hmm. And there's even so layers the kaiju- to it. Like, they're telling people, they, did, they didn't even tell people that it's Lilith's seed. Like, most people don't even know that there's two different type, types of seeds. Mm-hmm. But there's a secret organization that knows all of this info. And they're defending Lilith. Because what they want to do is use her godlike power. She's kind of dead, by the way. She's not really alive. She's actually inside of her egg under the earth, like crucified, like nailed to this giant red cross. And she has a spear sticking out of her. So it's like, uh. so 
that's like Christ-like imagery because in her death she like bled and gave the world life. Really, that's really weird. It's really cool, but uh, yeah, it's very demonic, creepy imagery. So they want to use her power Makes sense. to essentially re-dissolve all of life back into her so that all of our, the walls that separate our minds can dissolve and we can come together and create one super organism that no longer has emotional needs because we're all combined so we've all like met each other's needs because humanity needs each other but we're separate so we kind of hurt each other on accident as we try to like coexist okay so they're trying to dissolve that barrier so that we can all live in unity as one organism dang so they're that's why they're defending lilith from the okay. Anime. Now, the mechas, you start out the anime thinking they're robots because they look like robots. Yes. But it turns out what they did is they cloned Adam and mixed it with some human DNA to create giant humanoid creatures that have like this godlike power of Adam. Okay. But they couldn't figure out how to reproduce something. I think they call it in the show an S2 drive. It's something that all the angels have that gives them limitless power. So the, these creatures are literally walking around hooked up to what looks like the thing that you put in your car for gas, but just sticking out of their back. Like it even has the handle and everything, just sticking out of their back to give them power. <laughs> and apparently it's so much power that like the amount of money it's taking just to power these things are like causing nations to starve because of how expensive it is to run these machines. Oh my gosh, what? Because they're literally like godlike entities. And uh, you, f you only find out that they're part human later on in the show because when they get hurt, there's like fluid that comes out, but they have this weird technical name for it. So you're just like, oh, it's like robot fluid. But no, it's like actually blood that's coming out of the robots. or e They call them Avas. Mm, okay. Um, you only find out because when they turn them on, you're supposed to have a pilot. So they like insert this tube into the machine and through mm. like cyborg stuff, they're able to control the creature who is soulless, by the way, they explain. And uh, they, to give the creature some sort of soul so that it can actually like exist. They, now this is where it gets really weird. They use, oh, this is where it gets weird. <laughs> they use part of the soul of the pilot's dead mother and put it in the Ava. So that you have to have a dead mom whose soul they were able to salvage to be able what? to pilot them. So what? they usually use what? children. They ah! use children to pilot the machines. Like, like, I think they're all 14 in the show because they were able to salvage their dead mother's soul. And they do not tell the kids this, by the way. <laughs> they, just, they just pick up orphans and they're like, hey, you pilot this robot. Yeah, and it actually creates this really interesting dynamic in the show where all of the pilots have deep emotional issues because obviously their mom's dead and they're piloting giant robots with their mom's soul inside of it. And there's actually okay. like this really interesting imagery where – when they're inside piloting the robot, it's like they're in their mother's womb again. Because their mom's soul is literally in the thing. That's weird. That's and like, weird. Yeah, no. and the cockpits are like filled with this fluid. Ew. Like inside of fluid. Ew. And uh, the main character's Ava is the most powerful. Because it's not cloned from Adam. It's actually cloned from Lilith. Plot protection. Yeah, so somehow that makes it more powerful because the, the uniting of man thing somehow plays into that. Like, he, it's, he's the only Ava that, Ava unit that can, like, allow that to happen. It's very confusing, but for some reason, he's somehow, like, the key to be able to do that. And it deals with a lot of Freudian psychology because that's why all there's this, all this womb imagery. That makes because, sense, especially with all the dead mother talk. Yeah, there's this, that's why there's all that stuff going on, because a lot of it is about man's desire for peace 
So like returning to the non-existence of being in a safe like womb is that's, the idea. That's but they're weird. also mixing it with this like kind of Hindu idea of everyone reuniting into one God creature for peace. And it's a very good anime. I was debating on doing a spit take with all that water, but then I remembered that this is a laptop and very susceptible <laughs> to water, so probably not. But like, it would have been funny if I did. But also like, that's so weird. It's a very, very good anime. It's like, it's super different than other animes where the protagonist is like super gung ho uh -huh. and you know can't wait to get into the big robot to fight the bad guys this guy's like constantly not wanting to get in there because he's traumatized he is a he is basically the age of a freshman and he has the responsibility of saving the world and he is that's obviously way too much to handle and his mom's dead and his dad is running the secret intelligence thing and he never sees his dad but he pilots the machine to get his dad's praise. It's very complicated. That's okay. See, I really like that because it displays the humanity instead of the savior. Like, Absolutely, yeah. I that's one of the things that I really have a problem with with like Marvel movies and like just superhero movies in general. One of my one of my all time favorite scenes in a Marvel movie was when Iron Man. It's an Iron Man three. He's in a he's in a club because he's Tony Stark, oh, yeah. and someone pops a bottle of a champagne, and he has flashbacks to New York where the world almost ended and all the aliens were coming down, and he literally has like a seizure and like post from and PTSD from this, and he gets yeah. in his Iron Man suit and he like he just calls his Iron Man suit and he just collapses on the club floor like right there, and like yeah, I love that. Like, that scene and, like, what you're talking about with Evangelion, like, the actual humanity that is behind, like, those shows and, like, those scenes never gets displayed. But when it does, I think that is so much more powerful than Heroes Rising Up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, this delves so deep into human need hmm. while using these, like, these themes of, like, ascending to godhood and like reuniting and returning to the womb as sort of this like supernatural escape from all these problems that we're seeking hmm. interesting it's crazy good it also deals a lot with sexuality but not like in a way that's like overtly sexual it's more about intimacy hmm. more about okay. the main character's need for intimacy and obviously he's a 14 year old boy so yeah. And he's surrounded by women for some reason in the show. Because it's anime. So there's a lot of like awkward scenes where he's like trying to reach out. He wants intimacy from these other people, but they're just as messed up as he is. So they have like superiority complexes and pride issues and they want his intimacy as well. But they're like, there's also pushback because it's like a weakness to make yourself vulnerable. Mm, that makes sense. It's great. I love it so much. Wow. Okay. So there's like, a lot of. I think like you kinda, like it. It's like kind of traumatizing, though. It's super intense. I was about to say, I think you like it more for the, more for the human interaction. Yeah, yeah. The lore, though, I wish I kind of wish they would have explored it more because there's a lot of interesting symbolism with the robots fighting and the kaiju and everything. But they like they spend very little time explaining what's actually happening. So you're just constantly confused in the show. You don't really understand why they have to do what they have to do. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. But great show. I highly recommend it. Hmm. Definitely have to like, give that a look. See what is it on Netflix? Yeah. They, I think they just put it on Netflix. That's why I found it. Sick. Cool. I'll have to look that up. We should uh, rewatch it together so we can talk about it. I'd, I'd really enjoy that. I would love watching it with you. Sick. Well, you got a topic? I just talked forever. Um, I had one. What was it? Oh, um, mine won't be mine won't be like as long. But okay, so I've been posting a ton of Instagram polls lately, just because like it's fun, gives people something to do. Like you can just yeah. hop on the boat. Have you seen those? 
Yeah, I've been I've been taking part. Good. Um, did you see the one where would you rather learn an instrument or learn to cook? Yes. Did you see the statistics that I posted? No, I haven't seen results on that one. Okay, so um, the, at the time when I posted it, here, I'll pull it up right now. At the time when I posted it, it was, I think it was 49% to 51%. 49% learn how to cook, 51% learn an instrument. And but the most interesting part to me was hang on where, where is it i think it was majority of the people who chose learn how to cook were men majority of the people who chose learn an instrument were women and I was, looking at, I was looking at that and i was like huh like i like i know there's something in there with stereotypes and something in there with like people wanting to break stereotypes yeah, there's definitely something there. I chose also, learn how to cook. Huh? I chose learn how to cook. So I'm one of the men that chose learn how to cook. I also chose learn how to cook. Huh. I actually I, really enjoy cooking. It's so fun. Yeah. Plus I, there's something to be said for like making a dish and having it be like just so tasty and knowing yeah. that you made it. You made it. And especially if you came up with the recipe, it's even more satisfying. That is huge. That is huge. Coming up with something from like, or like adding ingredients or like putting your own twist on something, that is, in, that is insanely satisfying and is by far makes any dish way better. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like physical art. It's art that you interact with. Yeah. And that just art that you it, can eat. Yeah, it makes it so much more fulfilling. Facts. You experience facts. it. And you get to enjoy the process of creating it, being creative, creating it. And then you get to do just like indulge your senses in it. Fact. Dude, Texture, it takes taste, smell. It takes in three, it takes in four out of the five senses. I was yeah, about I to mean, say the only thing that you're really not stimulating is, is, uh, is your um, Hearing. Uh, ears, like sound. Yeah, exactly. Well, sometimes you do. Okay, the scene in Ratatouille. When they're like, when they're talking about like how you know how good bread is by the sound, and she like oh. tears it. I've noticed like like the crunch of chips That's or like true, actually yeah like the sound of biting into an apple, like the crisp sound, or like the gooey melted cheese, like you can hear it, like when you're chewing it. Mm -hmm. Like there's something to be said about the sound of food that is surprisingly good. Yeah, I haven't thought about that before, but I'm, I'm seeing it. Definitely seeing it, especially in drinks, because I like a fizzy drink that you can hear and like oh. you hear the ice clanking. Dude, oh, a nice glass cup with ice in it. Pour yeah. a fizzy soda. Side point: Did you know that most people can tell whether a drink is hot or cold just by the sound it makes when pouring? Really? Yeah, I saw a study in that. It's like a subconscious thing. Like, you don't really know how you know, but you know. Wait, really? Yeah, I saw, it was so cool. I saw a study about it. It, so, it sounds different. It, it actually sounds different. What? I can't, no I can't way. remember. I can't remember what the difference actually sounds like. I'd have to look it up again, but most people can tell. I guess, okay, my guess would be like the cold one. This is going to sound really weird. I guess the cold one sounds like harder or crisper and the warm one sounds like smoother i actually i actually think it's opposite no I'm, I'd thinking, really... I'm thinking about when you pour something that's like boiling hot that like that like uh sound uh, i can't describe the sound okay. it's kind of like the sound of boiling but when you're pouring it in that kind of like deeper like sound it makes as like the drips kind of like hit the water and it just sounds like yeah. No, I mean, it See, sound I, like was that. Thinking, I was thinking of like pouring like foaming milk, like or like espresso, or like pouring a hot cocoa. Okay, yeah, and, that's like, pretty smooth. Think of think of like the deep and like rich sound that has. Okay, yeah, I think hot sounds richer. Yes, deeper and richer. Not so much, not so much softer and smoother. Deeper and richer. But I'm not sure. I'd have to actually go try this tonight. I really like. Yeah. That's really interesting. I really like that. 
Hmm. Okay, I want to try and come up with a theoretical explanation for why men shows cooking more and why women shows instrument more. I I personally think that part of the reason was women were like learn how to cook, like I already know. <laughs> I okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of it was I think some of them know how to cook 100% I won't deny that I think part of it is that when they see cook they just get turned off to it they're just like it's not I don't want to do it. like I don't want to do that like I don't want to fall into that stereotype I don't want to fall into that category and so they chose an instrument and yeah. I think for guys it's because like well I can't survive on mac and cheese alone and I'd like to know how to make <laughs> man, it man does not live on mac and cheese alone exactly and it's like, I would like to learn how to make a chicken Alfredo and a nice salad. So I'm going to okay. choose to learn how to cook. I, that's a pretty reasonable explanation. I can see a woman seeing that and that being like, that is already expected of me in society. Yeah. Not I think it could deal. be very subconscious. I think it could be. Yeah, because I'm thinking like, if it was like, learn how to drive stick or something, I don't know, something stereotypically masculine, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be that interested in it. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of normal. Plus, learning how to drive stick, not that fun. I know how to. Kind of obnoxious. I tried once, but I never, like, really continued to try and learn because it wasn't a necessary skill. Hills are a pain. Like, they suck so much. I've heard. I almost rolled into a cop cop car behind me. I I have a theory that men like food more than women, or or at least more possessive of food than women. And... I My theory is based entirely off of watching couples share food where the woman tries to eat the man's food and the man is territorial about his food. Because mm-hmm. I do that too. It doesn't even oh, yeah. matter if it's like an insignificant amount. I'm like, I chose that amount on purpose. Yeah. Dude, That's okay. Exactly the amount I want. If you take okay. it, I have to add more. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you much? Okay. So you're out, you're out to eat with your wife and she's like, oh, I'm not hungry. And she takes like three of your fries. Wouldn't you much rather spend like five dollars for an extra medium fry? And just be like, here you go. Just please take it. Yes. Don't don't touch mine. In fact, I think I've done something like that before. Not exactly like that, but like Kristen's like, I'm not hungry, and I'm like, order something so you don't eat my food. Yeah. Exactly. Hundred percent. And I don't really know what it is about it because it's really not that significant. Like a couple bites really doesn't make a difference. Oh, are you kidding me? Like four or five fries? No difference. But it's just, it just, mm. It's like you, I mean, that, that difference is like neg- negligible. It, it could just be user error. Like when I make food, I don't measure stuff. So it's going to be a couple bites different each time. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's like. For, but for some reason, I'm like, that's the amount I want. That's why yeah. I made that amount. Like. Like there was one time I was making pancakes and I made like, like six or seven pancakes for myself. They weren't big. They were like, they were like okay, yeah. something like that. And I was sitting there and I'm wolfing them down and my dad comes up and he's like, oh, you made some pancakes. And he took one off the plate and he started eating it. And I was like, <laughs> I would have made you some. Like, exactly. Yeah. I, you would rather go through the work of making additional yes. food, even though it's way more work. Yes. It's like it. I would much rather spend the extra money, do the extra work, whatever. I don't care. You get your food. I get my food. Yeah. I don't know why. I feel like it's something innate in men where like food is a valuable resource. And we are like, we're like programmed to like be economic with that resource. Like, our food is ours. We'll get more if you need more. You know, don't eat my food. That's my food. I need this food. It's like, I, oh, dude, I don't get it. Because I've noticed that when groups of girls eat, I've seen them. They just share. My wife, they're totally fine with sharing food. I'm they like, just share. That's all they do. Doing? In fact, sometimes my wife gets angry if I don't eat some of her food because she wants me to experience it with her. Yeah. Which what is that? Perfect- that's a perfectly, okay, you know, that's a respectable thing. You want to have, share the experience. You, you want me to know what you're tasting. But, like, I didn't order that food for a reason. Yeah, that's not what I go for. What I want. Food, it's not bad or, or wrong. It's just not why I eat food. Yeah. Dude, I ordered this avocado bacon cheeseburger because. I was feeling like avocado bacon cheeseburger. You can mm. eat your Caesar salad. 
Yeah, exactly. Don't I don't want none of that. I don't, want, I don't want none of that salad. But women, they got to try everybody's plate. They got to know. Dude, oh, I don't get it. I don't get it. I think we're just territorial with food for some reason. Probably. For some, I find it so much more satisfying when I eat all of it by myself. Oh, yeah. If I know at the end that there's one bite that I, <laughs> that I didn't eat, it's less satisfying. Dude, I, the other day, I wasn't even that hungry. And my mom got us, like, some bacon cheeseburgers from Dairy Queen. And, like, I was expecting, like, some McDonald's, like, tiny bacon cheeseburgers. Okay. These were, like, big, big bacon burgers. cheeseburgers. Like, these were big boys. And she's like, yeah, I got you too. And I was like, sick. And I started eating the second one and I was like, uh, my stomach hurts, but she <laughs> got me too. And I'm going to eat the second cheeseburger. Yeah, you can feel like you have to. Dude, and let me tell you, I ate it. I hurt. I yeah. physically hurt when I did. Yeah. <sighs> Don't know Why are we like that? I think it has something to do with us being descendants from farmers and, like, hunters of the land. Yeah. I mean, that's why we, like, want sugar and fat so much, because that's what, that's what keeps you alive in nature. Mm-hmm. True. It's scarcer. So that's why we gorge ourselves when we have it. Yeah. That makes sense. Dude, chocolate chips? Just eat that crap plain. Just grab a handful of chocolate chips from the bag. Sugar. Yeah. It is so satisfying. Yeah. Fat and sugar is so satisfying. The, the big three are fat, sugar, and carbs. Yeah. Those are the most satisfying foods. Dude, and you know what's super good? Chocolate on bread. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You get, mm. Mm. One of my favorite desserts is just bread with honey and butter on it. Oh, that sounds fire. You just get such a pure taste of carbs fat sugar <laughs> yeah yeah exactly your body knows exactly what you're doing mm-hmm. and it one of my happy about it dude one of my favorites tortilla peanut butter chocolate chips melt it oh. for like 30 seconds oh so good i ate a lot of ice cream yesterday because it was my anniversary good what type uh, of ice cream um some kind of coffee flavor i don't remember exactly what it was called Ooh, coffee flavored ice cream that's stuff. my favorite coffee flavored ice cream. Mm. Dude, chocolate ice cream with peanut butter chunks. Oh, oh I love that so much. You're going to make me hungry. Gotta stop talking Dude, about I it. am getting hungry. I ate a big beefy uh, quesadilla this morning. Yo, uh, quesadillas. Mmm. It was really good. It was really good. I had, it was mostly beans, black beans. Oh, you had like a taco burrito thing. Kind of, yeah. I like them. I like them chunky, I like them thick, with a lot of filling. See, when I have a quesadilla, I just mean cheese and tortilla. Like, see, I like that, but I'm also like, I'm health conscious, so you know, I'm trying to put a bunch of goodies in there. Yeah, you know that's fair. That's fair. And I topped it with avocado and onion. Oh, avocado! It was really good. Mm. So, humans are what do we call it? Dimorphic, I think it's called. Dimorphic. And there's, and that, uh, that, that basically means that the female and male bodies are different shapes physically. Yes. Yes, they are. I wonder if that plays into why, why we, why I've observed this difference in food. I wonder if it's nature and not, you know, somehow nurture from society. I don't want to offend feminists, but I do believe that men and women are generally different, generally, not as a rule. That's interesting. Because I believe now, okay, I'm not a scientist, I could be completely wrong in this, but I believe the theory is, is that female bodies are more designed for kind of being the size that's more suitable for the environment and then carrying extra resources for like child rearing. Hmm, okay. So that's why women actually like um, 
what's the word? Acquire, I suppose, body fat easier than men. That makes sense. And uh, obviously, like, because they bear the child and they need to, like, breastfeed, all that kind yeah, of stuff. They have stuff. to have so the resources to take care of the child. Yeah, so they're, like, musculature, bone system and everything, bone structure mm -hmm. is more, like, supposed to be ideal for the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then also they carry extra resources where male bodies have extra bone structure and muscle mass because in nature like in more primitive human societies the men are the ones that defend and do like the actual fighting yeah okay now again i am not saying that that's purely what men and women do no, it's, yeah. it's a generality that yeah. creates if you were to look at it like on a graph it's generally mm -hmm. like that but not always yeah there's no i can agree with that there's, yeah, there's certainly like easy, you can find easily exceptions to the rule. There's plenty of Olympic female athletes <laughs> that are oh, way yeah. stronger than me. <laughs> oh, way yeah. bigger. And there's plenty of guys that are a lot better nurturers. But True. I wonder if it has something to do with that because men are generally, the theory goes, it's again, it's a theory, mm -hmm. designed more for kind of defending and acquiring resources. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. I like, okay, well, I mean, like, think about it. Like, female athletes and stuff, like, that's kind of recent. Like, yeah, it's not that common. Like, it's, it's within the last hundred years. And think of how long our bodies have, like, been evolving and stuff like that. Yeah. So, like, Obviously, the st like obviously the stereotype is not a hundred percent true. That's yeah. Just, like Serena Williams could absolutely crush me in a tennis match. Oh, absolutely! Are you kidding? No contest. Ronda, Ronda Rousey, kick my butt. Are he would you... definitely be a hunter in hunter gatherer society. <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent, dude. She could probably fight half of Multnomah off at the same time, like hundred <laughs> percent. Probably just by pure intimidation alone. Yeah, exactly. Like. Like, obviously, the stereotype's not 100%, but think of how long that, like, humans have existed and, like, how long those roles were in place and how recently it's just now being yeah. broken. I think obviously, we, Sorry, yeah. I cut you off. Obviously, that, like, that microevolution that's going to have, that will take place with those bodies, that will start to be seen soon, but, like, it's not going to be anything dramatic anytime soon. It's going to take a long time just because of how set in our ways we were. Yeah. I think it's really telling when you look at the structure of more quote unquote primitive societies that are still yes. in like what you'd consider a tribal. Yes. Tribal yes, phase. Exactly. Like if you look at early native American societies and like uh, tribes that are still like in the Amazonian and stuff. And even, mm -hmm. you know, a couple hundred years ago, tribes that were found on like islands and stuff, they usually have that structure where the men are hunters and warriors yeah. And the women are more about nurturing and, and homemaking, for lack of a better word. Yeah. That's just, that was just how their society functioned. And, yeah, it's telling because that's pretty consistent across cultures that have been separated for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were to go to, like, literally any island, any culture, anywhere in the world during that time period, man was out working, hunting, getting food, whatever. The woman was at home, cleaning, yeah. taking care of the family, being the nurturer. And I've heard that, surprisingly, that there's, there's a lot of society that have prominent matriarchal figures as well. So another mm. stereotype is that generally there's like a male leader. Mm. But I've noticed, I haven't done that much research, in, research I'm just kind of interested. It's like, I'm like casually interested in this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've noticed that there's it's pretty common there's matriarchal filt figures like elders and stuff mm. motherly influences see that's the part that's always like that's always weirded me out like why like why is it always matriarchal figures like like i guess like the men fight for it more they like they yeah. desire for it more cuz i feel like i feel like women would make 
like just as good, if not better leaders because of their nurturing side. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in many cases, I think that's why that kind of does that kind of a matriarchal thing kind of rises up because while it is more common for a, for there to be like a male chief leader, mm -hmm. there's I think pretty often like a fee, like there's female elders respected in the society. So the male leader doesn't have absolute authority. In fact, actually, I was just learning about Sparta not that long ago. This is a perfect example. Sparta isn't as tribal, but you were talking basically about there was two kings in Sparta, two male kings, I think eventually turned into just one king. Mm -hmm. But that king didn't have all the power. He actually relied on upper class females because in Spartan society, when a man died in war, all of his wealth went to his wife. So there started to be a class of very wealthy women in Sparta. So they ended up having a great deal of the political influence. The king relied on these women for support. And that's because the men were going out and fighting in war and sort of being an expendable role, kind of playing an expendable role in the society. So it got left with a lot of women who were actually alive and actually able to acquire wealth and wisdom and age. Okay. Finally found, so there was a Tumblr thread pretty much about this same thing. Um, so, um, here it is. So yeah, going along with that also, so like there's a scene in, um, I think it's 300 where the dude is like getting challenged to a fight and he's like, he's like one of the biggest, baddest dudes. And he turns around and he looks at his wife and she not, and she literally like nods approval, like, yeah, yeah. go. And, um, so let me see, they talk about it. Okay, so also Spartan women were given small knives that if their husbands came home and tried to hit them or assault them, they had a weapon within reach. Oh, this weapon was used for cutting husbands' faces so that when he went out in public, everyone would know that he was a jerk who tried, oh to, abuse, who tried to abuse them, and they would publicly shame him. Also along with that, during the Spartan times, women could own land and were considered citizens. That yeah. is a huge deal during that time period. Because yeah. that's completely rare, and there are lots of places today where women can't even get that. Divorce was absolutely fine, and a woman could expect to keep her own wealth and get custody of the kids because parental lineage wasn't very important, and it didn't matter, and it didn't make her a pari pariah? Yeah, that's like an outcast. Yes, yeah, it didn't make her a pariah. She could totally remarry, no big deal at all. Spartan women participated in BA sporting events too, and because they were expected to be physically fit as Spartan men folk, who had to serve compulsory military duties, by the way, and couldn't marry until they finished at 30. They had time to do lots of, they didn't have time for lots of swishy dresses, so they wore notoriously short skirts. According to some accounts, their thighs were visible at times. During, <laughs> oh during yeah, that time period, thighs. during that time period, that's insane. That's yeah. very scandalous. I've heard that the rest of the world mm -hmm. did not like Spartan women. Yes. Um, also in Sparta, men only got their names on their grades if they died in battle. And women, women only got their names on their grades if they died in childbirth. The yep. Spartans compared childbirth to battle and was viewed as an honorable way to die. Yeah, I've heard about that. That's pretty telling about that culture. Mm -hmm. They really valued women. They did. And I think it was probably because of that law I don't know which came first, but I would, I would suspect that because the women had this route to acquire so much wealth and influence, they kind of had to be respected. Yeah, exactly. And that's another interesting thing <laughs> that I just thought of, is how in societies we kind of find this polarization of a, of a man's role in the society. They're often either the top, they're, they're often either the top and the bottom. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Like the leader, like the kings and stuff. Although actually, we're a surprising amount of queens that were the sole rulers of 
kingdoms in uh, like Middle Ages and stuff, but but generally a male like head of state, like mm. male senate stuff like that. But then also male laborers, male expendable warriors, and we even see that in our society where like most of the the most dangerous jobs and lowest paying jobs and even the most homeless they're all men true and women generally are more in the middle of society mm. so men kind of both play either end up being the leader or the kind of expendable members of society i think that's i think part of that is because like I, uh, I don't really know how to say, I'm going to say it like this, but women are often viewed as like being needed to take, take, whoa, 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 words. Women um, are often viewed as like men need to take care of them and like provide for them. Like yeah. that's not saying that they can't do it on their own. They absolutely can. And I know plenty of women who can and do that much better than I take care of myself. Um, but like the man has to provide food the man has to provide money the man has to provide a house or like stable living conditions for the wife that has been such a stereotype for so long i think it's kind of been padded into all of the statistics that's why women kind of buffer the middle class yeah i think you're probably right so there's also an interesting thing where uh studies can't point to one again i could be kind of wrong mm. but uh studies show more that, that, that men are more that men care more about status like social status and rank i 100 percent agree with that and women do except yeah. when it comes to finding a partner men generally don't care what the social status of their partner is women generally care more and they want to marry up in social status again generality it's you i wouldn't say it's usually true but it's true enough that it's kind of shows a trend i would agree with that yeah i've been watching this show called 60 days in very very old show have you seen mm -hmm. that no i haven't heard of it Okay, it's like a reality show where normal people go to jail for two months just to Whoa. see what it's like, and it's to help the um, it's to help the people running the jail figure out how to improve it, how to improve the jail by getting a non-biased opinion mm -hmm. from, from the inside. Very interesting. Ooh. But I noticed that the female section and the male section are completely different environments. Oh yeah. The female section they kind of become friends it's it kind of feels like a summer camp situation it's more there's a lot more drama and it kind of gets dangerous because they're like it's kind of like they're, they're, there's a lot of people on drugs so they get like mm -hmm. very territorial and defensive about defending their drug use yeah and you can like easily become an outcast but it's generally like it's safer Mm, okay and the men's pods i've noticed it's almost like a chimpanzee society <laughs> where everything is based on like displaying dominant behavior <laughs> me man me talk yeah and it kind of it, it it manifests through like social connections so like you can try Not and become yeah, you can, like, try and get in the crew of a dominant male, and that gives you, like, social status and respect. Or you mm. can try to be the big, scary male. But what you don't want is to show passive behavior, because then you become a target for everybody else to take advantage of you. And it becomes really dangerous. Like, there are so many cases of people getting beat just for, like, being weak, basically. Like... Like people, like people trade what's called commissary, I think. I think that's a general term for it. Mm -hmm. It's like stuff that you get in prison, like food and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. People trade it, and if you like are in debt, people will like violently collect the debt 
unless you're like a dominant figure, then you have like more freedom to kind of okay. take from other people. Hmm. That's interesting. And it's scary. And I'm like, why are men, why are the men so much more volatile? Like they just instantly form the society. Like they form the top dog and yeah. there's followers. And you fight for it. Like, physically usually that's interesting but why does that happen why can't they just relax a little bit be more like the women and they would get through prison way easier like they make it so much harder on themselves that's weird yeah i don't get it I feel like part of it's just like men are more primitive, like just in a lot in a lot of ways. I agree. Yeah, just in a natural state, like huh? That's interesting. I've been thinking about this stuff a lot lately from watching that show and like I, I watched a uh, or listened to I didn't watch a podcast about why societies go to war and like oh, the yeah. process of uh, what motivates people to like join the war effort and what why leaders go to war and that kind of stuff and one of the really interesting points is how in world war ii young men were pressured even by their mothers to go fight in the war even though it was dangerous you think that like just from a biological standpoint you don't want your son to go out and die because that that's the end of your gene pool (laughs) You want to protect him but people get so caught up in this group identity Mm. of kind of nationalism that dying for that group is like it becomes more important than your own life and your own status you 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 kind of replace the nation's status with your own put your nationality over your genealogy yeah over yourself Mm. It was really interesting because he's like, we see in every culture when you go to war, the society pressures the young men to go fight, even the mothers, even the people closest to them. Like there was, yeah. there was cases of people being shamed by their own family for not enlisting. Enlisting. That's wild to me. Yeah. The second I picked up a Call of Duty game, my father was like, you're never joining the military. Never. (laughs) Like, the second my hand touched it, he was like, no, this is going to make you feel invincible. This is going to make you want to join the military, and you're going to get shot. And I was like, dad, it's not going to do anything like that. It it does glorify the military quite a bit. For me, it did the opposite. You know how many times I die in a Call of Duty match? <laughs> <laughs> like, I am not cut out for this. <laughs> exactly. Like, and if that's how much I'm dying in Call of Duty, Lord knows I'd be standing out in the middle of the open with my gun, like, and just get sniped in the face. Yeah. You don't respawn in real life. Like, that. no, that doesn't happen. That's it. You can't hit X to watch to skip your kill cam. You can't do that. <laughs> you know how sometimes... Um, there can be like depression and identity issues when a woman finds out she can't have a child. Yes. Because that's like part of their purpose. Yeah. I wonder if in civilized society, men ever feel like they are purposeless because they can't express the primitive, like, I don't want to say warrior, but I guess kind of like warrior instinct because hmm. because the evolutionary theory is our bodies kind of like women's bodies are designed the more fight. child rearing our ours are designed more for literally physical violence that's interesting i wonder if that ever causes problems if there's not like a physical outlet because i because there's also a lot of men that are completely not physical and they're more yeah like there's not like there's there's kind of two stereotypes. One is like the big burly manly man sports guy. Mm. And then also like the nerd at school, you know, glasses. Yeah. Like when I think of that, I think of Zay Zay, Isaiah Harris, 
and David Fetter. Like very different builds. <laughs> and very different builds. Like Isaiah Harris is like I think he's like five nine, like two hundred seventy five pounds of muscle. Like he's a like he is a big dude. You see big him, guy. you see him and you're like, Wow, that's a big, big man. Big man. He could uh he could probably crush a watermelon with his hands. I I believe it. I don't know if he could, but I'd like to see him try. I'm That'd sure he could fun. figure it out. Maybe put like a chokehold. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think he could. And you see David Fetters and you look at him and you're like, he's a tall, skinny dude. With glasses. Yeah. Probably likes to read. <laughs> I think he does. That's fair. He does like to read. He really does like to read. And see, then, I use those two because they fall into the stereotypes like so well. Yeah, and those are both kind of stereotypical stereotypically masculine things. Yeah, exactly. The kind of burly manly man gets more of like the manly thing, but like men are, are kind of associated more with like the, uh, the scientist, I guess. Yeah, exactly. The, the kind like, of like obsessive intellectual. There's the intellectual heads of society. And then there are the physical heads of society. And, and I think again, that is reflective in our society, like STEM, STEM fields. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Very dominant, dominated by masculinity, which I would agree is certainly a product of our society, but I would also say a big portion of it is our nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I wonder if there's ever anxiety or depression issues associated with men if we're not able to fulfill those, those purposes of kind of being thing-oriented, like being you know, kind of being like the warriors of a society, you know, going out, doing the, doing the science researches, doing the actual physical labor. Because huh. I want to go into a relational field, right? I want to be a pastor. Yeah, same. Yeah, so I don't even fit those, those molds. Great, dude. We're the outliers. We're like dormant biological weapons. <laughs> we may not be the influential ones now but wait till your kids start acting like us <laughs> uh, Dang. but seriously because there's like a lot of men that are uh, like like commit suicide I think that's the highest demographic as young demographic as young men yeah I wonder yeah. if it's ever it's because they feel like I wonder if that's part of it I have no, I have, I have no idea though. Well, I mean, like, think of like the stereotype. Like, no one understands me. Like, no one, no one talks to me. No one gets me. It's because yeah. they don't have that. They don't have that outlet to like be themselves or like to talk to other people about that stuff. I think that goes both ways, though. I wouldn't say that men go through that more than women. Like, not feeling like you're not understood when you're young. I would say, I honestly, I think they do. Like. People make the stereotypes that men are so cut and dry and two-dimensional, like, oh, yeah. men like food, That's oh, true. men like to punch stuff, and, like, like we're still people, and, like, we still have the feelings, not to, like, get on that train, but, like, I just feel like men don't get near as many outlets in their life. I think they're starting to, 100%, but I just don't think they are given the opportunities yeah. in their life. I wish we had a woman on this podcast so we could get more insight. Agreed. Cause I want to like kind of balance this out and say like, you know, talk about more like a woman's role in society, like how that has developed in, in culture. Dude, but get, honestly, let's get, don't, Alyssa, let's get Alyssa or Kristen back on here. And we'll talk about <laughs> it then. I don't know if we could do that with this such short notice. Oh no, not right now. But I mean like for the, the next future. episode, we'll put a pin in this and we'll bring it back up. Think about a woman's role in society. Come back and give us a short essay response. <laughs> Whichever one of you writes the better essay, we'll put on the podcast. <laughs> that would actually be kind of interesting to see. Really funny. My wife cares very little about uh, like roles in society. Yeah, you told me a little bit, and it's very funny. Yeah, she's just like, I don't care that I'm expected to be X, Y, and Z because I am X, Y, and Z. It's kind of cool, honestly. Yeah, 
she's like it's not she's like it's not an issue that's the way most women are mm -hmm. like it's very unfortunate when there's a woman that's not like that and she acknowledges that but she's like i'm not like i'm more angry once when, when people pressure me to not be like a woman huh that's interesting but also like that's fair yeah I mean, she's also said on the podcast that, like, she's never cared about, like, the yeah. women's right to vote. <laughs> she's, she's honestly said to me, like, I wouldn't care that much if I lost my right to vote. I'm not interested in that. Well, okay, think about it. Low-key, at this point in life, that'd kind of be a stress relief. <laughs> That's like, like so I feel like that is the most patriarchal thing that we could argue for it's actually an advantage for women not to vote well but i mean like okay but like think about it like at this stage at this stage in life with like all the presidential candidates that we have yeah so i see what you're saying honestly yeah. trump versus hillary and you don't get to vote in that that's a blessing i could see that yeah i could see that being like i'm not responsible at all for anything that takes place yeah exactly but at the same time, I would never argue that women not voting is better for society. Oh, I would never say that. Are you kidding me? The more input we have, the better. Absolutely. I think that the free exchange of ideas between everyone is the best thing we can, we can do for our society. That's called democracy. Exactly. That's the way this country works. Exactly. We're the more people, the better. When did we start this? Like 410. Or, okay, so it's, we've been about an hour? About an hour, yeah. About an hour and ten minutes. Mm -hmm. You got anything else? Dude. Not really. That was pretty solid. That was surprisingly deep. Yeah. Started talking about Evangelion, and then we talked about <laughs> the patriarchal society roles of each person. You know that flatworms reproduce solely through rape? What? Found that out today. That, okay, wait, wait, wait. What? So flatworms are all born with penises. Okay. And uh, the way that they impregnate is they have a fight with their, <laughs> with their penises. <laughs> it's literally called penis fencing. They try and stab each other with their penises. <laughs> and they inseminate each other. And the the loser becomes the female <laughs> because they got stabbed. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a lot like prison. But anyways, she they, they get stabbed, and the reason is it's because it's more costly to bear the children. So they literally fight over who has to bear the eggs. So if you win, you get to pass on your genes without having to. Yeah. Because you're the you're obviously you're the strong one. Yeah. So you make the weaker one carry your genes. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that's messed up. That's wild. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't like that. that at all. No, not at all. It's it makes sense. I understand how that works. Like why it would be biologically beneficial for an organism to do that. But it's scary. That's terrifying. I just want to hit you rapid fire with a couple more ideas that I found that I wanted to talk about for like the last two podcasts, but we kept having deep conversations. Dude, hit me with them right now. Let's just go rapid fire. Um, what if crop circles aren't put there by aliens, but it's literally put there by the corn trying to communicate with us? And we keep thinking it's aliens, but it's the corn. That means that corn is sentient, and sentient. I feel bad for eating corn. it. Maybe it's like a hive mind type of deal. When you get them all in a field like that, they kind of connect and create a mind. All the roots go down into one cognitive system. Exactly. Hot dang. That's wild. What if? Okay, here's I'm another one. The biggest, the largest living organism. Guess what it is and where it is. Where it is? Organism. Organism. It's 
the megalodon in the bottom of the ocean? Incorrect. It's a fungus in Oregon. It is multiple acres large. It is bigger than a blue whale. One fungal creature, organism, and it's in Oregon. That is terrifying. I'm kind of proud that it's in our state. Dude, well, go, go Oregon. Proud of you guys. Well, yeah, technically it's not your state, but I feel like you're kind of an Oregonian because you went to school at Multnomah. I feel like that's enough. You lived in Portland. Go me! That's enough. You can be an honorary Oregonian. I'll take it. Also, Oregon, I feel like, I wish, I wish Oregon, like, got more clout, you know, among the state community. I feel like we don't, we don't get much. We're just kind of there. We're there up north. Here's the thing. Portland is all the clout Oregon will ever get. That's true, and I don't like that because Portland is my least favorite part of Oregon. It's the most stereotypical city. Yeah. Like, just ever. That's so true. <laughs> like even like even though the saying is keep Portland weird. It's yeah, at the same it's time so it is so stereotypical. Um, yes. Yes. That's why I don't like hipsters. In the pursuit of not having a label, you have just adopted another identity, another group identity. And that's exactly what Portland has does. They're like, oh, we're so progressive and weird and different, like everybody else. Yep. Anyways, okay. <laughs> You're 100% right. I'm with you on that. Okay. Do you get anxiety when you have to talk to customer service reps? No. Okay. Well, that's very common for people like ordering food and it stuff. Is. Very common anxiety. Those same oh, people, those same people, including myself, I'm one of those people, don't get anxiety when you're ordering for somebody else. Oh, no. Not at all. Yeah. That has never happened for me. Like, I don't like calling the customer service numbers because for some reason I just get nervous. So you feel like you're a burden and a pain. Yeah, but then when I'm like calling for my wife, I'm like, no problem. Give me the phone. Yeah, exactly. I don't get it. I don't know. Also, like ordering food. I don't, this doesn't happen to me anymore, but I used to like get nervous ordering food. Mm -hmm. But going in and ordering something for someone else does not produce anxiety for me. Mm, that's interesting. I don't know why, but that's just a thought. Okay, um, last one. Scientists are literally making computers out of neurons, like human brain right. cells. Wait, 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 like, like, like computers, like typing computers, or like, like just processors, like computing processors. neurons using neurons. They made a uh, computer that can fly a like flight simulator, like a plane simulator out of rat brain neurons that's called artificial intelligence and that's dangerous yeah it's kind of scary but also this is something that i've been saying forever what if like what if you made a computer out of organic components does it do we consider that a living organism because some would argue that the term artificial intelligence is kind of a misnomer because it is intelligence. It's not artificial. Here's the thing. Artificial intelligence, okay, just like AI is dangerous, always. Because yeah. if it ever gets any form of right and wrong, it is going to see humans as wrong. And the way, the way to correct that is to get rid of them. So it's going to be every time. It could happen. If the U.S. makes it, it's going to view people in the East. It's going to view Iraq, Iran, Korea, whoever we're at war with at that time. It's going to view them as wrong because the Americans made it. And it's going to say, okay, well, we just need to delete them. Absolute extermination. Mm -hmm. Because that's just, that's just how a computer goes. And then when the handler says, no, we can't do that, they're going to view the handler as a, right. uh, uh, what's the word? A, uh, a, 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 the, 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 the. a hindrance? I can't think of the word. 
It's in the way. Uh, like a like a stumbling block. Yeah, it's in the way. So you're gonna you're gonna remove. The exactly. Gonna exactly. Remove the it could happen. Okay. That's just that's just how artificial intelligence will go 100% of the time. But then it's even scarier when you think about the fact that we're like growing neurons to make computers because like my computer died is going to take on a whole new meaning. It's like it actually died. It was a creature. That's... It, it was organic. It was an organism. And it, was, okay. and it was kind of intelligent too. That's not okay. That's not, that's not. Yeah, I mean, like, we're literally making brains to use as computers. That's got to be against some sort of Geneva Convention, right? Feels like it, doesn't it? Because I'm just imagining, like, a rat. It, okay, it's not the same as, like, a, a brain. Like, you, they used rat neurons. That doesn't mean, like, they're using a rat brain. They're using the physical components of a rat brain to create a computer. It's different. What's the difference between the physical co components of a rat brain from a human brain? Like, honestly. They're not that different. Exactly. Yeah. But it's not, what I'm saying is it's not the same as just, like, removing a brain and plugging it into a, like, you know, plugging into something. It's different. It's a different thing. It's not going to think like a person. This is concerning. But on yeah. some level, it's all, it's kind of like, it's, like, how do you argue that's not a living organism? It has an intelligence, and it's made biologically. That's terrifying, and I don't like that, because it's that's like going to be artificial intelligence, and that's how we die. Can you imagine waking up after, di like, being in a car crash, and you are, like, somebody's computer? <laughs> Dude, okay, that reminds me of, um, have, okay, have you seen Black Mirror? I think we've talked about this. Yeah, I've seen some episodes. Okay, did you see the one where um, a person takes a part of their DNA and clones themselves, and that clone's sole job is to serve the person in their house? I have not seen that. Okay. So, okay, so basically, you take a part of your DNA and, like, you clone yourself, and, like, your house is, like, kind of, like, living basically and the clone of you is put into like a chip or like a little ball or something and it like it can control the temperature of the house it turns the toast on it like okay so it's like starts a, the a coffee made yeah exactly it's like it's like alexa but like a person made of a person's brain yes exactly and in the episode um like it's taken from the viewpoint of the person's brain oh. and so like the person wakes up and they're like oh okay time to start my day and they sit up and they're just in this blank empty world and they're like wait what is this like what's happening and like all of a sudden like a computer a computer rises up out of the ground and it's like a tutorial like oh like you are this person's servant like you're this person's house your job is to serve this person but oh you're God. also a human that's scary, and that's kind of a possibility. But it gets it gets worse. And so, like, since they're a human and they have their own will, they don't want to do that. They want to live their own life. They want to live to their job. So, obviously, they're going to rebel. Yeah. Well, to get them to become subservient, there's someone who kind of, like, monitors each one and, like, kind of, like, gets them into line before they go and get installed in the house. Oh, my God. And so the person is like, hey, you need to do this because this is your job. This is why you're here. And the person's like, no. And the, like, the bulb is like, no, I want to go. I want to go live my life. I want to go experience stuff. And the person's like, no, you don't get to do that. Okay, I'm going to lock you away for two hours by yourself. And so they shut down the bulb for, quote, unquote, two hours, even though it's like five minutes in the real world. And so then they turn it back on, and they're like, okay, how was it? And they're like, okay, like, I don't like, it was two hours. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, come on, man, get me out of here. And they're like, okay, I'm about to lock you up for a year. And they set a timer. So it's like, it's like 10 minutes okay. and a year, a year goes by in the bulb and they turn it back on. And like the person's like shaggy in a beard and they're completely shut off from everyone. They're completely alone. They, they can't eat or drink. So they feel like they're thirsty or hungry, even though they don't need it. 
scary. Dude, it's terrifying. I hope that does not become a reality. Imagine you wake up one day and your sole job is to start someone's bathtub. That reminds me of an episode of Rick and Morty where they create a sentient robot whose purpose is to pass butter. Pass butter. <laughs> you pass butter. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's terrible. <sighs> Great show, though. It's a good it show. It feels <laughs> illegal to make computers out of... I, dude, that's got to be against some, some, some sort of convention. Has to be. I kind of have a theory that like I, I agree with the people that say artificial intelligence is a misnomer and that we should consider it actual intelligence oh 100 percent, we should but here's where it gets tricky do we consider it consciousness no i don't i don't know if that line becomes blurrier once it's made of brain I think consciousness is tied to a soul, and artificial intelligence does not have a soul. I hope it's tied to a soul, because that makes everything a lot easier. It has to be. Because what if one day, far in the future, um, we're running a youth group, and there's an android boy, and we have to tell that android boy that you don't have a soul and you can't go to heaven. <gasps> I could never. I could never. But it's like actually like an intelligent creature at that point i think i think it's possible but like is that's it how that kid would respond that that screaming in the background that's how the kid would respond <laughs> yeah because like you create a robot like that it would be really hard not to think it's conscious if it behaves like a human like if it rebels and like it cries and it laughs yeah it's gonna want freedom That's so weird. I don't know. I Maybe I'm giving us too much power, but I kind of feel, feel like we could create consciousness that way somehow through computers. Because, like, obviously brains and computers are different, but there's a lot of crossovers, there's a lot that's similar. But who's to say that the soul isn't created somehow through that process? I don't even know. Because I would like to say that only God creates souls. Oh, I 100% think so. But, like, we're the ones that can choose to have a baby, though, so it's, not, it's kind of some human, there's human influence over it. Yeah. So through our mad scientisting, we create a being that has to be endowed with a soul. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Ministry is going to get real complicated once there's androids running around. That's weird. It's going to be a whole like issue for the church. Do we think androids can go to heaven? Are they? Like, can animals go to heaven? Can androids go exactly. to heaven? Exactly. That's going to become a way bigger issue. Like, are humans the only ones that go to heaven? There's going to be people that, like, only humans are created in the image of God. Only we go to heaven. And there's other people that are going to be like, well, they're created in our image. So they're kind of still in the image of God. That's, that's weird, dude. I don't know how I feel about this. I think these are going to be real issues. I'm preparing for it. <laughs> I'm just praying that doesn't come up before the end times. Seriously, because that is complicated. That's terrifying. Because I've even, like, see, I've, I've conceded that I think we could create a consciousness through, through AI. Really? But, you think we could? But I don't know if we could create something that has a soul. I feel like that's different. But I don't really know. I don't know where the Very line different. is. Bro, I don't even know. I really don't know. There's no way to know, I think. And that's what makes it so hard. Blew my mind. Well, on that note, I feel like it's a good place to end. 
Wow. Okay. Um, thanks for tuning in, uh, Androids. Yeah. Maybe. Dude, freaking one day. Maybe one day in the Dude. future an Android is going to listen to this, and we and we are going to be looked down on in the eyes of history for not giving Androids the human rights they deserve. It's true. It's the even debate that they might not be conscious is going to be just absolutely from the devil satanic how could you how dare we how How dare dare we we? and i'll just say how dare i how dare you how dare both of us that's just my go-to response for that um well that was that was a surprisingly deep one that was fun yeah no problem Alrighty, well, thank you all for tuning in. Always a good time. We always appreciate it. Um, Yeah, it's a good time. Catch you all later.